So we're going to talk about um, Acts 23. It's a plot to kill Paul. It speaks to us of God's providential protection. You know, uh, I work around all kinds of different bugs of viruses and bacteria. And frequently, and I get coughed on and sneezed at and exposed in all kinds of ways some of you don't even want to know. <laughs> and about once a week in this season, people ask me, they say, how do you keep from getting sick? And I say two things. One, uh, I have an immune system. And that God gave me that. He built that inside of me. And, you know, all the time, whether I wake or sleep, whether I'm thinking about it or not, he, he protects me through that immune system that I have. And the second answer is even though people have immune systems, they certainly get sick, don't they? And so it's the grace of God is the other answer to that. It's simply God. And I'm thankful that I don't get sick more often thankful for his protection can you think of some ways that he protects you how does he protect you besides that ooh I make a bad choice but he gives me grace anyway ooh that's that's a good one through the body through believers, and we're sure thankful for that this last week. Okay? Helps to come alongside you and helps to give you strength and hold you up. Encourage you. <laughs> he makes us miserable when we're living in sin. I think that's absolutely true. You know, I, I thought about um, there's uh, myself, there's, there's my property and my animals, and I, I thought about my dog. You know, I, I looked in my dog's mouth. Have you looked there lately at your dog? You look at those, those teeth, and they could like really harm you, couldn't they? If they, if they got out of control or got angry or... But they don't. I mean, my dog is so sweet, and she just like comes up and wants to scratch like continually. But she could really hurt me if she chose to. And, and you know, and that'd be true for you too, unless your dog's like a Chihuahua or like a little terrier. But even then, even then, they hurt when they bite. I got bit by a terrier. And then there's Josh's dog. If he bit you, you lose a leg, you know. He's got a great day. Let's consider for a moment. Let's think about Exodus. Chapter 7 through 11. We've been going through this in our devotions at home, and it talks about the plagues as they came on Israel. And during that time, it really sticks out to me, this idea of protection, because... As we see each of these plagues, we see the blood that comes and it turns the Nile River. But it not only was the Nile River, but it was all the, the streams and the lakes and even the buckets of water on people's property would be turned to blood, except in one place. Where was that in Egypt? It was Goshen, the place where the Israelites lived. All their water supply was sustained. And, and when the uh, frogs were in everybody's cereal bowl and you know, in their, on their toothbrush and throughout their whole house, throughout Egypt, there were how many frogs in Goshen? Like zero, or maybe the usual quota of frogs, maybe, in their place. And you think about the hail, this hail that came and it would destroy animals and crops and even kill people if they were out in it. And 
you know, the storm comes and the line stops right at the city limits of Goshen. It's untouched. And even the darkness, you'd think, well, the darkness was certainly over the whole land, right? But, but it, says, it says that uh, there was light like usual in Goshen. And then we see the angel of death. And how was it that they were kept? It was a little different than the other plagues. They were kept from the angel of death by something that they needed to do. What was that? They needed to sacrifice the lamb. And they needed to take its blood and put it on the doorpost of their house. And then the angel of death would pass over them. God's protection for His people. It's really pointed out in those passages. And it was because Pharaoh wouldn't listen. You know, um, there was a reason God protected them and did those things in Egypt. Do you know why God allowed the plagues to come on Pharaoh? He was making a statement to the world. He was telling a story that would be passed on from generation to generation. The greatest king on earth would not stand against those plagues. His army, mighty, stronger than any army on earth, would be wiped out. And God did it. And it was clear to everyone that God did it. That's His great purpose. He wanted to rescue His people. And He wanted everyone to know that. You know, that's a, a lot like our, um, our story. It's a story of providential protection. And um, we've been storying through the Bible. We've come to Acts, and we're at Acts chapter 23. So I'll have you turn there. And Paul has been sharing the Word. He's been preaching the Gospel through... Israel to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. We come to this chapter 23. I want to go back. Pastor um, did the first part of this message last week. I want to give you a little bit of context. I'm just going to share a few verses back from chapter 21 and then 22 and then we'll uh, start our story. So Paul's headed for Jerusalem. There was opposition among the Jews. Uh, they wanted to arrest him. Chapter 21, verse 12 says, when, when we heard this, speaking about the people, the believers at the time in Jerusalem, we heard that that was their intent. We and the local believers all begged Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Paul, don't go. You know what's going to happen. But he said, well, why all this weeping? You're, you're breaking my heart. I'm ready not only to be jailed, but I'm even ready to die for the cause of Christ. Verse 18. He meets with the elders of the church in Jerusalem and they tell him, Jewish Christians think that you're against the law, that you're trying to abandon the law of Moses. So we need to stop these rumors. Verse 21, there's four Jewish believers and they have to take a vow to God and they are to go to the temple to fulfill the vow's requirements. And so Paul goes with them and he takes this vow and it takes seven days and they're at the temple. And on the very last day, Paul is out in, in the community, in the market, and he's with a Gentile. And he's seen there. And he's later in the temple. And so the, the word goes out, Paul's got Gentiles in the temple wasn't true, but that's what was said. And so things get really stirred up at that point. And I want you to watch as we go through this. Think about it from the perspective of I want to see where God's protective hand is in this story. And how many times that happens. There'll be a quiz, by the way, afterwards. Verse 30, the whole city was rocked by these accusations and a great riot followed. 
Paul was grabbed and dragged out of the temple, as we saw last week, and they were beating him and trying to kill him. But the commander of the Roman, uh, this Roman regiment stepped in, and he stopped, he didn't have to stop, at his presence stopped the beating. And the commander came, verse 33 of chapter 21, and he rested Paul, and he put him in chains. And he took him to a fortress, but the crowd wouldn't stop. They had to put him on people's shoulders because they were trying to grab him and tear him apart. So to protect him, they put him above the crowd. Verse 36, the crowd followed behind shouting, Kill him! Kill him! The Roman commander had no idea who Paul was. He couldn't get a straight story from anyone. He thought that he was an Egyptian who had led a group of assassins in a rebellion in the desert. So he asks Paul, and Paul says, not me. I didn't do that. I'm a Jew. I'm a citizen from Tarsus. Let me speak to the people again. So Paul stands on the stairs of the fortress, and he tells his story in Aramaic. That's the people's language that he's speaking to. They become very quiet because, hey, this is spoken in our language. We can connect with this. And chapter 22, he tells his story of being on the Damascus Road. There he's been uh, arresting and imprisoning and killing Christians. And God stopped him with this bright light from heaven. And he speaks to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Paul says, who are you, Lord? The Lord says, I am Jesus the Nazarene. What should I do? He says, uh, Jesus tells him to go to Damascus and do what I tell you. Verse 14, then he told me the, the God of my ancestors was chosen to know his will, for you, to, for you are to be his witness. This is your job. You're to be his witness telling everyone what you have seen and heard. Paul calls on the name of the Lord. And he's saved. He's baptized. His sins are washed away. Jesus told him they wouldn't listen to you in Jerusalem. So, verse 21, so I send you away to the Gentiles. <sighs> when Paul spoke that word, the word Gentile, the crowd erupted. It went crazy. They came after him because they hated that thought. Gentile dogs, part of our promise. And they said, away with him. He's not fit to live. The commander brought Paul inside and ordered him to be scourged to make him confess to his crime even though he still didn't know what he was accused of. And they tied Paul down and they asked, and Paul asked a very astute question, probably good, good timing, a little motivation there, right? You're getting ready to be scourged. And he says, um, is it lawful to whip a Roman citizen who hasn't even been tried? Hmm, good question. And the man, the commander said, are you a Roman citizen? Paul tells him, yeah, I was born a Roman citizen. The commander was frightened. And he and his men backed off and they untied Paul. And then they ordered that the Sanhedrin should meet. The Sanhedrin is the Jewish high court, the ruling body of the Jews, authoritative on all religious matters. So he asked them to meet so he can try to figure out what's going on. He released Paul to stand before them. And it's interesting, this meeting of the Sanhedrin is the fifth time that they've met regarding the claims of Christ. Five times before they've met. They met with Jesus in Mark chapter 4. They met with Peter and John in Acts chapter 4. They met uh, with the apostles in Acts chapter 5, and they met with Stephen just before his martyrdom in Acts chapter 6. 
So five times the truth's been proclaimed to them, to this Jewish high council. They represent a religious authority in Israel. And five times they rejected the message. And they represented the nation. John 1.11 says, He came to His own people, and even they rejected Him. They received Him not. So the Sanhedrin is now in session, and that's where we start. Acts 23.1. Paul looks them uh, straight in the eye. Good, good policy, right? And he's not trying to be angry or mad. He's just being a man of integrity. He looks them right in the eye. And he says this. He said, I've lived before God with a clear conscience. Interesting statement, because, you know, part of that would be okay with them, because they were okay with his conscience when he was killing Christians and imprisoning them, and that part was just good, and they were fine with a clear conscience with that. But this part about speaking the gospel to people, telling them about Jesus and forgiveness of sins, hmm, and, and that message going out to Jew and Gentile, ugh. We don't. We can't have that. I, how can he have that clear conscience about that? Smack him in the mouth! And that's exactly what the high priest said. Hit him in the mouth. And the word isn't a little slap. It's the same word that's used for beating. The beating that Paul took in chapter 21. The same beating that they did to Jesus with the stick when they, when they pounded the, the thorns down on his head. Beat him. The Greek word is tupto. That's the word for beating that's used there. Paul responds to the high priest after he's hit hard. And uh, he says, God will slap you, you corrupt hip hypocrite. You break the law by hitting me. What kind of a judge are you anyway? Verse 4, those standing near said, do you insult the high priest? And immediately Paul apologizes. It's interesting he apologizes to his brothers there. He says, you know, I, I didn't know this guy was the high priest. Uh, the Old Testament tells me you must not speak evil of your rulers, so I wouldn't do that if I had known. The high priest Ananias was one of the most cruel and corrupt high priests ever to rule in Israel. He ruled for 12 years and his own people assassinated him. He was so popular. That was in 87, uh, AD 47 when he started. Verse 6, Paul realizes that the Sanhedrin is composed of both Pharisees and Sadducees, and his quick mind comes up with an interesting thought. He's going to make a statement that's going to stir things up. So he says, Brothers, I'm a Pharisee, and I am on trial because my hope is in resurrection. If you know anything about Pharisees and Sadducees, there's like opposite ends of the pole, right? What was it that the Sadducees believed? They don't believe in a resurrection. Did they believe in angels? Nope. Don't believe in spirits. They didn't even believe in an afterlife. The Pharisees, on the other hand, believed in all those things. And so guess what happened? An argument kind of breaks out. Because the Pharisees kind of stand with Paul on this. They agree with what he's saying, and the Sadducees absolutely don't. In this... Um, was a good plan until it gets so violent that Paul's in the middle and he's going to get torn apart by all this. And the uh, commander once again steps in. He's, be he's become the target of their aggression. And he protects Paul. And they take him back to the fortress. 
Paul's plans aren't working very well so far, are they? He is still alive. And God's behind all this, too. He's protecting him. But, but Paul's plans himself, the things that he does, don't seem to work out very well. How do you think Paul was feeling at this point? His mouth hurt. He just got smacked hard, beaten. What? Persecuted? Well, he, and he was. He was persecuted. Do you think, you know, he's been through persecution before, but do you think he's discouraged? Yeah. And I would suggest to you, I think he is discouraged. And I think he's a bit despondent and down. And the reason I say that is because of... Um, and think about what's happened. I mean, he, he's tried to get up and speak, and there was a riot, and then he uh, tried to um, speak again, and there's a shouting match, and then they try to tear him apart, and, and then there's a fist fight, and he's the punching bag. It's not gone well. He wants to get the gospel out, but they won't listen. They only want him to shut up for good. That's it. But verse 11 is why I think that he was despondent and down because something extraordinary happens in verse 11. If you didn't read any other thing in this whole passage, you should read verse 11. It's even in red letters in my Bible. Red letters, why would it be red? Because Jesus speaks, right? Jesus comes to Paul's side. He's directly with him. And he speaks to Paul and he says this, he says, be encouraged. And I think he said, be encouraged because Paul's discouraged. He's down. And he calls him by name and he calls him Paul. He doesn't call him Saul like he did last time, does he? Because his whole way of life has changed. Speaks to him personally. This must have been an incredible lift for Paul's spirit to have Christ with him at this moment in time. And I'm sure that Paul had recognized the providential hand of God as all these things that happened to him, and he's still alive, as Matt said, and he's still in one piece, even though his mouth hurts a little bit. He's been rescued over and over. Now the Lord's come to his side. And that's beyond explaining. That's beyond words. And notice what he tells him. There's a purpose in this. And what's his purpose? In verse 11, what is God's purpose? To witness, to testify for Him. In Jerusalem, it was, it's already passed. That was His purpose. Now it's going to be in Rome. And this task of testimony and witness that was given to the apostles in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, where Jesus said, you'll be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere. Notice it's first in Jerusalem and then to the ends of the earth. And that same um, thought, that same admonition in a way comes to us, doesn't it? Through the Great Commission where God tells us to disciple all nations. So we're given that command as well. So he says, you know, I know you've been a witness here in Jerusalem and you've accomplished the task. And I think God's pleased with it. Even though it went so badly in Paul's eyes, I think God's satisfied with this. I think this was according to God's plan and He's good with it. That's good to know, isn't it? When things go badly, that Christ is there. And... You're okay. Even though there's such conflict and turmoil and a lot of times affliction and, and trials that we would be involved in. There's trials in the church this week, right? For many. Well, all, how many of you have trials? Difficulties. One hand. Let's, let's see, okay, yeah, yeah. There's, there's more. They yeah, have almost everybody. Difficulty. But God 
stands with him. You know, uh, our job within this is to tell stories. That's what we've been doing, right? We've been going through the Bible telling stories, and that's what he's saying that we need to do is to become storytellers for him. To speak his message, his gospel. And we have a privilege in, to be able to do that. As he stands by us and he's providentially protecting us in a thousand ways, as my wife pointed out, a thousand ways we don't realize every day he protects us, he cares for us. You know, um, in verse 11, it, it, we said this that Paul is to go to Rome. Did Paul want to go to Rome? He talks about it a lot. If you read the first chapter of Romans, he says, you know, I've been praying, and I long to be with you, the church in Rome, and I want to be there, and I want to speak to people there. And Paul understood, and God understood above Paul, that, that Rome is like the major city in the world at the time, and, and it's a strategic place for Paul to speak. He's going to get to do that. He's privileged to be able to do that. Placed there by God. And he's to speak to governors and rulers and others, guards, and regular folks. You know, God protected him, but he would die in Rome. It's true of us, you know. God protects us to a point we're all going to die and we're all going to stand before Him. It doesn't take away the protection. We'll talk more about that and the spiritual reality that's greater. Let's look at verse 12 through 15. This is the conspiracy. In this, cons in this conspiracy, there's 40 Jews, more than 40 Jews, that come together and they, they connive a plan uh, to basically take Paul out, to to kill him. And they're not going to eat or drink until it happens. And they place on themselves anathema. Do you know what that is? That's the Greek. It's ath, uh, anathematica, I think, in the Greek. I probably said it wrong. But do you know what that word means? Paul talks about it in Galatians. It's a curse. It's they, they say we'll be cursed by God if we don't do this. That's a pretty solemn goal, uh, or a mo uh, solemn oath to take, I should say. And their great goal is that they want to kill Paul, an innocent man who's standing for the truth. They want to murder an innocent man, and they're going to be cursed by God if they don't accomplish that. That's twisted, isn't it? So the godly leaders that they had, the men that were over them, these religious leaders, they're going to hear this plan and they're going to say, you guys are so wrong, you need to repent and turn from this way, right? When they come to them with this plan? That's what they should have done, right? Did they do that? No. No, they go right along with this plan. They're totally they're connected to this. They're like, yeah, let's get rid of Paul. Uh, uh, and, and we'll take part. No trouble there. The chief priests and the rulers were haters. They were bloodthirsty. These guys were bloodthirsty. They wanted Paul's blood spilled. They would go along with the plan and even play a part in this murder. It didn't matter to them. In fact, they would take joy in it. So they'd ask the commander, bring Paul out, We'll ask some more questions. Well, that's what we say we're going to do, but we're actually going to have knives and kill him. You know, there's a lot of bloodthirsty men in the world. We've seen it this last week, haven't we? You look at ISIS and Al-Qaeda, and you look at France this last week. Twelve people murdered. Men who came in in God's name. Allah Akbar. It's the same thing. It's 
kind of a recurrent theme, isn't it? Satan uses this. Men who kill in God's name. But they're so lost. They're so deceived. Our response is to want to hate them, but we need to understand they're lost. They're totally deceived by Satan. They're working directly for him. And these guys, these Jewish leaders, were working directly for Satan. Jesus even told them that, didn't He? Your father's the devil. He said that to them. More than 40 guys sworn to get Paul. His goose is cooked, right? I mean, how are you going to get out of that? 40 guys that are sworn they're not going to eat or drink, they're going to kill you no matter what. What are you going to do? Verse 16. Somehow, Paul's nephew hears about a plot to kill him. Hmm. I wonder how that happened. And he tells Paul. And Paul says, I want you to go to the, the officer and ask the officer if you can talk to the commander, uh, this is his nephew, and tell him what's going on. So the, and Paul's a prisoner, and of course this little boy, um, He's probably not going to be treated very well, do you think? Because he's a prisoner's nephew. Who's he? And, and uh, what, are we going to believe him? But interestingly enough, they don't make fun of him or abuse him. But verse 19, the royal commander takes him by the hand. And he says, come privately with me and speak to me. And he listens carefully at what the boy says. And he, he takes this story to heart. There's such a stark contrast here between the commander, who's a Roman pagan. He's kind. He cares about the truth. He's sensible. He's protecting people. And he's even generous. Paul even gives him a horse to ride. The Jews, on the other hand, they want to spill blood. Their minds are lost in this vengeance idea. They're in a frenzy. It's kind of like sharks, you know, that get in a frenzy. They're just all about this and they're cruel and they don't care about the truth. They're blind. As we said, it's it's clearly Satan's realm. So the boy pleads with the commander. Don't do it. Don't take Paul out to be questioned. They'll kill him. The commander, verse 22, swears the boy to secrecy because he doesn't want him to go back and say anything to anybody and let them find out that they've discovered the plan because they'll just make a new plan, right? They'll find another way. So he's sworn to secrecy and the commander acts immediately. Nine o'clock at night, he takes 200 soldiers and 200 spearmen and 70 mounted troops. Almost 500 men for Paul. Puts him on a horse and they ride to Antipas. 17 miles, the first leg of the journey to, to Caesarea. And Caesarea is where the governor is and that's where he wants him to go. He's written a letter to the governor. And in the letter, it's interesting, a little insight. How do you, um, when you have to act, you know, before your boss, do you, um, do you, are you totally real and talk about all your failures? Or do you kind of tell the best side of things? Ooh. What, best foot forward. That's right. We tend to do that, don't we? I, I do that. And most of us do that. And this is what this guy does too. In this letter, he kind of forgets to tell him, I, I, I thought he was an Egyptian terrorist and I was getting ready to scourge him. He didn't put that in. But he learned he was a Roman citizen then, and, and he, he basically tells the story, though, puts the best face on it, dealing with his superiors, as we would. And he asks Felix to hear the, the case, and Felix learns that Paul is from Cilicia, and that's part of his jurisdiction, so he says, sure, I'll hear this case. So, Paul is taken to Caesarea, where he's kept in the governor's mansion, a little move up from the jail, right? A little more posh and uh, interesting how God works. Paul will be tried by Felix and found innocent. 
And he's tried four times, four different courts, all Roman, and each time he's declared innocent. Mark chapter 13, verse 9, Jesus said about his disciples, you will stand trial before governors and kings because you are my followers, but, but this will be your opportunity to tell them about me. That's what you're supposed to do. You have a story. Tell it. Do you see in this passage, as I went through, did you see providential protection for Paul? Um, how did you see that? What way was, was Paul protected? Okay. And they pulled him out of a number of situations. In fact, if, did you, anybody count? How many times? Five times in this passage. He was dragged out in the temple first. They sought to kill him. Acts 21.30. Then he was taken to the stairs of the castle. They were going to kill him there. Verse, uh, chapter 21, verse 35. Conclu conclusion of his speech on the stairs. They're going to kill him again. Then he comes before the Sanhedrin. They get stirred up. Acts chapter 23, verse 10. And last, this plot to kill him with 40 men. And there's a military escort. Acts 23, 23. Five separate times, God intervenes, protects Paul through this Roman commander. Is, are there other ways that you could see his protection besides that in this passage? Okay. Yep. Yep. He was not only he heard it, but somebody listened to him, and that was probably amazing that that, that happened. God's providence. What about the timing of this? It wasn't during the day. It was at night. It was 9 o'clock at night. So they could, they could move him and under cover of darkness. So not only is God sovereign over time, He's sovereign over timing. Exactly when things happen. Any other things that you saw in this? Yeah. <laughs> he uh, he uh, took what he knew to be their beliefs and used them, didn't he? And God used it in that situation. And then he protected Paul <laughs> again. You know, we've said this, but I want to ask it again. Is God's providence... You know, if you watched movies like Noah you get the idea that God is far off and displaced and we just can't figure out what in the world He's saying. Is He like that? We saw that in verse 11 here, didn't we? That, that God is like close and nearby and He steps in and He's right there beside Paul. And He speaks to him. Comes directly to him when He's discouraged and despondent. What about us? Does He do that for us in any way? How does he do that with us? Is he close? How close? I'm sorry? Closer than a brother, and in fact, I'm sorry? He dwells in us by the Holy Spirit, he like is inside our hearts. Okay, so he's in that. He, in him, we live and move and have our being. Even if he wasn't in us, he'd be right next to us too, right? So he's very close, and he gives us he gives us instruction. He gives us like a lot of instruction. The Bible's a big book, right? There's a lot here, and he, and he speaks to us. I, I thought about this passage. It's interesting, providentially. It's Psalm 73. <laughs> That's the passage that came to my mind, and it was a little different than what the pastor said. A little further down, he says this statement. He says, He holds my right hand. He stands by me. And He holds my right hand in trouble. You know, He gives us brothers and sisters. We said that, and they, they come alongside us. And um, this that's particularly timely this week where there's been a death of... Um, Bob and Sandy's son this last week. And there are people in the body to come alongside and to speak to them and to hold them and 
just to listen. We need to do that. He gives us prayer where we can speak to Him, where we can speak about our hurts and our struggles and our concerns. So we've said it many times, God's purpose in preserving Paul and preserving us, what is our main purpose? It's to do what? To witness. Yeah. That's what it's about. So to, to witness, you have to tell a story. Do, do you know the story? Can you tell someone the gospel? Ooh, wow, we're in trouble. Can, can I get some hands? Can you tell another person the gospel? Okay. If you need help with that, we want to help you with that. There, there are four parts, basically, right? First part is what? We, we are sinners. We're lost, and in fact, we are in fact um, guilty before God. We've broken His law, and we deserve hell and, and death. I'd say that's two in my estimation. And third, what has um, what has God done? What has He done for us? He He sent His Son to take care of sin. Exactly, to be the satisfying payment for our sin. And we need to. Respond. How do we respond? We confess our sin and we turn from it. We repent and we trust Him. We believe Him. And we believe Him enough not just to say, oh, that was good, God. Thanks a lot. I'm going my own way now. No, but to be willing to follow Him. He works that in through us. So we need to know the message. And through this message, He delivers people, right? The ultimate. He delivers from death and hell. The complete and ultimate protection. We're saved and rescued and protected from judgment by the message of the Gospel as we respond to that. So how do we keep from spiritual harm this gospel message helps us. Let's look for a second at Satan. Let's look at Satan's main goal in the world. If you went to 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, it says this, Satan has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They're unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand the message. So Satan's main goal is to confuse the news, right? He wants us not to understand this. He wants, to, in fact, to get people to misunderstand this, to understand that they play a part, that they're, it's dependent somehow on their works in order to get them to heaven. For example, it's not believers here that are deceived, it's unbelievers. God's main goal, we said, was to get us, have us tell this story, tell it clearly, and to tell it. Satan's main goal is to misunderstand it, to confuse it. But with all this said, who's your, if you're an unbeliever, who's your greatest enemy? Trick question. God is your greatest enemy if you're an unbeliever because you stand at war with Him, the Scripture says. It says that we're under His wrath, that even at this moment, if you're an unbelieving person, that there is the the weight of the wrath of God that is above your head and it's ready to come down. But this, he puts out this gospel call. He appeals to people. He says, come. Come, let us reason together. Come. And I'll forgive you if you trust me. And Colossians 1.20 says this, He's made peace. Even though we were at war, He's made peace through the blood of His cross. That through His sacrifice, He takes away His anger. We can live in a relationship with a loving Father who looks at us as children. His children. 
to share an inheritance with him. And the war that's gone on where we were at enmity and fighting against him and wanting our own way, that's done away through the blood of the cross. There's peace. It says to those who come, he won't cast them out. So by his mercy, he gives us strength to repent and believe. And those who persist, in their own way, and reject God, they only have judgment to look forward to. Eternal death and hell, the worst harm that can come to anyone. There's other spiritual enemies. There's public enemy number one. Who is public enemy number one? It's me. It's my flesh. You see, all this stuff, the world... And Satan and all of it comes through my eyes and through my heart. And I have a decision to make. And it's my flesh a lot of times, all the time, that causes me to go my own way. I don't like what God's saying. I don't want to tell this story because people are not going to like me if I tell this story. I don't like to be in opposition. I don't like to confront people. Don't make me do this. He calls me to be a witness. He gives me instruction in Scripture. If you read the Proverbs, there's so much instruction. The lazy man, the lustful man, the angry man. It talks about the harm that comes from each of those things lived in that lifestyle. But I can be kept from harm if I'll go God's way. I don't care what God says. I want what I want when I want it. We need to submit ourselves to Him. I want to just read this in closing because it really touched my soul. We find shelter and protection in God Himself. I want you to turn to Psalm 91. And you can read this whole psalm when you have time because I don't. Uh, I'll read part of it. But it is full, through and through God's protective hand towards us. Let me just read a few verses. Psalm 91, starting at verse 1. And I'll read through verse 4 first. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God, and I trust Him. For He will rescue me from every trap and protect you from deadly disease. He will cover you with His feathers. He will shelter you with His wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. Verse 8, just open your eyes and see how the wicked are punished. Verse 14, the Lord says, I will rescue those who love me. I will protect those who trust in my name. When they call on me, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. I will reward them with a long life. That's physical. But it's not always true, is it? Jesus and Paul didn't have a long life. But as a general rule, He gives us long life as we follow His ways, and He gives them salvation. That's spiritual protection. Eternal. With Him. So let's thank God for His providential protection, which is intricately worked out in our lives every day. And it's going to be for eternity. Physically, we're immortal till we die. And then we live on. I like that. We're immortal till we die. Jimmy Elliott said it this way, let us give what we can't keep to gain what we can't lose. Let's be bold to share the Gospel. Let's, we're called to be His witnesses. Let's tell His story. And let's thank, let us uh, go to Him and thank Him for His providential protection. Let's pray. Father, we come to You and we are, um, we are in awe at the ways around us that You work. And we are so thankful that You do give us mercy. We know that we deserve judgment, yet as we come to You, we we find forgiveness. 
We find help in times of affliction and trouble. We find that you're right there with us. and You even hold us by our hand and you comfort us and you help us. We're thankful, God, that you have a plan to do this for eternity too. It's not just for a brief time. We thank you for your Son who was willing to become a human sacrifice so that we could know your protection, that we could have peace through the blood of his cross. We thank you for Jesus. Help us to live for him. Help us to speak his story. In Jesus' name, amen. When you look at the life of the Apostle Paul and you think about how well-renowned was he, how respected was he, what do you think? Away with this man from the earth. Away with him. Tear him in pieces. Plot. The Roman soldiers five times over, as Dr. Stewart pointed, had to intervene to keep him from being destroyed by anger. Let's back up once. Let's see, he had a Lord, Jesus Christ. How renowned was he on the earth? How popular? Crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And they had to turn the Roman government into the process of doing that. Hmm. 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 Yeah, let's compare. In eternity, how renowned will the Lord Jesus Christ be? The Bible tells us this, every knee shall bend and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ, this is the words, that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's what will happen. Wow. Amazing. And the Apostle Paul, what about him? How renowned is he in the church? And how renowned will he be in heaven? Well, in comparison to the Lord Jesus Christ, he'll cast his crowns at his feet. And you know, that'll be what it's worth. That I can some way express to him appreciation. And how does God give it to us? Does he give it to us because we are so good and we perform so well here? I mean, look at me now. Oh, if my friends could just see me. Is that why he gives it to us? Uh, he gives it to us because by faith we're justified. Some folks in the past have said it's by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And you know, that's it. According to the scriptures alone, that's it. By faith, we get this. Not because you turn so well, not because you perform so well, not because you pray so well. The only thing is this faith.